On tonight's summary of the Israel-Hamas war, day 204, Hamas publishes a video of two more Israeli hostages, each of them calling upon the Israeli government to reach a hostage deal as quickly as possible. Back-channel hostage negotiations between Israel and Egypt produce two possible truce avenues. Hamas is currently reviewing them. The IDF is moving tank units down south and drafting more reserve units, preparing for the Rafah invasion. Construction work has begun on the pier in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip, preparing for the activation of the Maritime Humanitarian Corridor. Continuing escalations between Israel and Hezbollah. Hezbollah has launched repeated barrages of rockets towards Israel, as the IDF has assassinated members of the Jamal Islamiyah movement and continues escalating raids throughout Lebanon. Hello everyone, I am Alon Burstein, visiting assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and Israel Institute Fellow at the University of California, Irvine, here bringing you the latest highlights from the Israel-Hamas war. It is currently the evening of April 27, 2024 in the United States, the morning of April 28, 2024 in the Middle East. Starting with the hostage situation, over the past few days negotiations have developed between Israel and Egypt, advancing two different tracks for a possible truce and hostage exchange. Yesterday, on April 26th, I published a video with details about this on my channel, going into the specifics about both tracks and what they include, so I'm not going to go into all of the nuances right now. Feel free to check out that video if you want to know all of the specifics. In principle, Egypt is trying to push for a larger deal that will involve, in the first phase, Israel halting all of its plans for a Rafah invasion. In the second phase, all the Israeli hostages being released over two stages, to 10 weeks apart, in exchange for the release of Palestinian prisoners. And in the third phase, a one-year ceasefire between the sides and beginning the foundation for a Palestinian state. In turn, Israel is also putting forth a smaller short-term deal, focusing on the first phase of the original terms that were being negotiated, a hostage deal that will focus on the quote-unquote humanitarian hostages, that is 33 hostages that include women, elderly, sick, and injured. Hamas has reportedly received Israel's proposal and is studying it, although at this point it is unclear if it has received both proposals or just one of them. Either way, Hamas has officially said that it received it and is studying it. The Saudi Al Arabia News Network reported that Yahya Sinwar has personally received the details of the deal and is reviewing them. Today, as these negotiations are going on, Hamas released another video of two Israeli hostages. I remind everyone that several days ago, Hamas released a video of the Israeli-American hostage, Hirsch Goldberg Polin. Today, the two hostages that are seen in the video are Keith Sigal, who's age 64, and Omri Miran, age 47. The two are filmed separately and edited to show them speaking one after the other. The video opens showing Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu and Defense Minister Gallant stating that military pressure will bring the hostages back, while in the background are pictures of hostages that Hamas says have been killed by IDF bombings and the military operation. Both of the hostages speak about Passover, stating that they could not celebrate together with family this year and reminisce about last year, and express hope of celebrating the next holiday with their family, specifically stating that that is Israel's independence. Day. Miran also states that he has been held captive for 202 days, indicating this was shot just a few days ago. Sigal calls upon the Israeli government to participate in negotiations and to reach a deal as soon as possible to bring all of the hostages home. And Miran states similar things, also stating that the government should do more and not leave the hostages behind. Both of them state that they are in danger from the bombings, and both reference the demonstrations that are being held in Israel calling for a hostage deal, asking the Israeli public to apply more pressure on the Israeli government to bring them home. The video ends with Hebrew and Arabic writing addressing the Israeli public, stating, and I, I quote the translation here, Your Nazi rulers do not care about the fate of your kidnapped sons or how they feel. It then, then calls upon Israelis, do what has to be done before it is too late. So with all this, where do things stand right now? The, all the sides are awaiting Hamas's response as the weight of the negotiation has shifted from Qatar to Egypt. This has been something that I spoke about in the video that I put out yesterday also, that Israel has tried to shift the weight from Qatar to Egypt, which is going to end up having a lot of actual influence on the way the negotiations are held, because this means that the, the internal leadership of Hamas in the Gaza Strip will be more involved. The external leadership resides in Qatar, and therefore when Qatar was running the negotiations, they negotiated more with the external leadership. In turn, Egypt is more associated with Yahya Sinwar and the internal leadership in the Gaza Strip, and therefore, right now, the deal has been given to Sinwar himself. This may actually speed things up in terms of getting answers from Hamas. We will learn more about this in the coming days. 
Another possible indication that Hamas is taking this seriously is a report that came in today that Ismail Haniya, the external leader of Hamas, met today with the deputy leader of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, Jamil Mazhar, as well as with the deputy leader of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Muhammad al-Hindi. According to reports, both of them discussed the hostage negotiations. This may prove important because Hamas cannot guarantee a deal without getting the approval of the other organizations that are holding hostages. The fact that Hamas had that meeting today and publicized that it had that meeting indicates that they are probably taking these negotiations seriously. It also indicates that they may want to prolong negotiations in order to stall the Rafah invasion. Again, we are going to learn about that in the coming days. Moving on to the Gaza Strip, there were no rockets or mortars that were fired from the Gaza Strip towards Israel in the last 48 hours. Regarding the fighting in the Gaza Strip, the IDF has presence now only in the Netzarim Corridor and in the central areas of the Gaza Strip. However, there were substantial airstrikes and bombings that were reported throughout the entire Strip. In the northern parts of the Strip, on April 26, there was a substantial bombing that was reported in the heart of Gaza City, near the Red Cross Center that houses internally displaced Palestinians. Five people were reportedly killed. Today, on April 27th, in the central parts of the Gaza Strip, substantial bombings were reported in the Al Nusirat refugee camp and in the areas of El Muaraka. This is also in the central parts of the Strip. The IDF reported that it was targeting a car with Hamas operatives in Al Nusirat refugee camp. Palestinian sources stated that eight people were killed in that strike. The IDF had said that eight Hamas operatives were in the car, so presumably that is the same figure that they are talking about, the same airstrike. However, they did not specifically confirm that. In the southern parts of the Gaza Strip, bombings were reported in the Al Nasser neighborhood, this is the northeast areas of Rafah. Seven people were reportedly killed. Earlier bombings were also reported in Han Yunis, targeting launching sites from where rockets were fired into the, towards Ashdod several days ago. Other news related to the Gaza Strip and specifically to the looming invasion of Rafah. On April 26, AP reported that the IDF has been moving dozens of tanks and armored vehicles towards strategic areas where they would deploy for the Rafah invasion. This comes amidst different reports that the IDF has been stepping up its, prep its preparations for the Rafah invasion, and the IDF has its plans ready and is just waiting for the green light for from the political establishment. The IDF has also pulled up several different reserve units and put them on standby in anticipation of this invasion. In addition to this, al Arabi al-Jadid also reported that as part of Egypt's preparation for the Rafah invasion, different districts in Sinai and the Suez Canal have been ordered to go into emergency regulations, including preparing hospitals and canceling any vacations. In addition, in addition all personnel on the quote-unquote Israel and Palestine desk of Egypt's foreign office have been instructed to cancel all vacations as of next week. Amidst this, on April 27th, Thomas Friedman published an article in the New York Times stating, among others, that sources in the U.S. administration have confirmed to him that if Israel launches a massive operation in Rafah without the U.S.'s approval, the Biden administration may consider limiting weapons sales to Israel. Right now, it is unclear if the United States has given its approval to the Rafah invasion or not. There were rumors that in exchange for Israel not carrying out a major retaliation against Iran in the escalations from last week, that in turn the United States will sign off on the Rafah invasion. However, that has not been publicly stated, and right now, it is unclear if Israel is preparing for this invasion because the U.S. has signed off on it, or if Israel is preparing for this invasion as part of a negotiation tactic. Again, we do not know right now. Other news related to the Gaza Strip, Fahir Ludhammer, who heads the UN Agency for Clearing Mines in Iraq, estimated in a report today that clearing the rubble in the Gaza Strip could take up to 14 years. According to his assessment, in Gaza there are roughly 37 million tons of rubble from the different buildings that have been bombed out, and the process of clearing this is going to be extremely dangerous due to the ammunition that may not have exploded and the massive weaponry in the area. Estimates are that 10% of the ammunition that has been fired into the Gaza Strip has not detonated, meaning that a lot of it is buried under the rubble, and the clearing process, he estimates, would not necessarily be faster than 100 trucks a day. According to his estimate, that will take up to 14 years. Regarding casualties, no IDF soldier was reported killed or injured in the Gaza Strip since my last report 48 hours ago, leaving the total number of IDF soldiers killed in the Gaza Strip since the invasion began on 261, and the total number of IDF soldiers injured in the Gaza Strip since the invasion began on 1,584. The Palestinian Health Ministry in the Gaza Strip is reporting that 76 Palestinians were killed in the Gaza Strip in the last 48 hours, bringing the total number of Palestinians killed in the Gaza Strip since the war began to 34,338. In addition to this, 77,434 Palestinians reported injured in the Gaza Strip since the war began. I remind everyone that there are still several thousand Palestinians that are missing, presumably buried under the rubbles, and are dead.
Moving on to the humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip. For the first time since the killing of the World Central Kitchen aid workers on April 1st, a ship carrying humanitarian aid has departed Cyprus on its way to the Gaza Strip. I remind everyone that this was part of a larger operation that was starting at that time, involving coordination between the IDF, the World Central Kitchen, and the United Arab Emirates. The United Arab Emirates were going to fund the humanitarian corridor that was going to come into the Gaza Strip and then be distributed by the World Central Kitchen. Both the World Central Kitchen and the United Arab Emirates suspended their activity after the incident on April 1st. It was now reported that this ship that departed today was also funded by the UAE, so it is possible that they are returning to their activities. However, it was not reported that the World Central Kitchen is going to be involved. As far as we know, they are still suspending their activities in the Gaza Strip. In addition to this, substantial work was reported today on the pier that the United States is constructing in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip in order to establish a more institutionalized maritime corridor to allow aid to flow into the Strip. According to reports, the entire compound is going to stretch a r- roughly 270 dunams, that is uh, almost 67 acres, and involves major areas for moving equipment and materials, a system of remote-operated hydraulic gates, and the establishment of a substantial electrical grid in order to let this entire system function. The floating pier is being constructed by the United States and will be attached to the beach and to the docks that are being prepared. The entire operation is being done under IDF security. According to reports, this is supposed to become operational. The initial report said at the end of April. It has been updated since, so it may be in the coming days. It remains to be seen. Other news related to the humanitarian situation, the United Nations has closed the case on five out of the 19 UNRWA employees that Israel stated participated in the October 7th attack, stating that Israel did not provide sufficient evidence of their participation. Amidst that, it was also reported in the last several days that Germany is reinstating its funding to UNRWA. This continues the trend of the countries that suspended their UNRWA funding after Israel made the allegation against the UNRWA employees. However, since then, a lot of those countries have returned. Now Germany has joined them. In addition to all this, BBC reported today the United Kingdom is considering sending British troops to the Gaza Strip in order to facilitate in the distribution of humanitarian aid. According to the report, the matter is still being considered. It was not stated if this is being coordinated with the IDF. It is unclear how this could happen without IDF approval. The United States has been adamant that despite its involvement in the establishment of the pier, the humanitarian corridor, no U.S. troops are going to be present in the Gaza Strip. Possibly the IDF is going to try to coordinate with the United Kingdom in order to have British troops. We do not know. Remains to be seen as it develops. Moving on to the West Bank, there were several different incidents reported in the last several days. On April 26th, in an unusual escalation, the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigades of Tulkarem, that is the military wing of Fatah, published a video showing its operatives firing into the Bat Hefer area. This is an Israeli town within the Green Line adjacent to the West Bank. This is somewhat unusual both because it's not usually an area where fire is carried out from the West Bank into Israel, but more importantly the fact that the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigades of Tulkarim specifically carried that out is almost a challenge that is being that is being sent up to the Fatah movement saying that they are not adhering to the policy of Fatah, which is not to have these escalations at this present time. So that is interesting also in terms of internal Palestinian politics as as well as possible developments with regards to the war. In addition to this, on April 27th, there was a Palestinian attack that was carried out on the Salem outpost near Jenin. This was a drive-by shooting. A Palestinian car pulled up near the outpost and carried out fire, then tried to escape. However, the IDF had positioned a stakeout in the region due to previous such shootings, and and two people in the car were shot and killed. M-16s were found in their car. In addition to this, substantial IDF activity was reported in the last 24 hours throughout the West Bank. Specifically, this was in the areas of Ramallah, Hebron, Nablus, Tulkarim, Jenin, and several other villages. But the Palestinian Prisoner Society reported that 20 Palestinians were arrested throughout the West Bank. The IDF did not give any of its own numbers. Other political news following monumental Israeli pressure in the last several days. The United States has agreed to postpone the sanctions that it was going to impose on the IDF Netzach Yehuda unit for repeated violations of human rights of Palestinians. Among others, it was reported that the United States received guarantees from Israel that it is dealing with the matter internally and that Israel's internal judicial system will, ad- will address any violations of this unit. Right now, it, that has been suspended and not taken off the books. Remains to be seen how that develops. Moving on to the northern parts of Israel, southern parts of Lebanon, there were continuous escalations in the last 48 hours between the sides, continuing the escalations that have been mounting in the last week between Israel and Hezbollah. Regarding the firing of rockets and missiles, on April 26th, Sharif Saud, who is an Israeli truck driver, was killed from an anti-tank missile that was fired towards the Hardov area from Lebanon. In addition, substantial barrages of rockets were fired towards the outposts in Hardov and in the Hermon area.
In addition to this, on April 27th, there were barrages of at least 25 rockets that were fired towards the areas of Mount Miron, as well as towards Bar Yochai and the Moroma Galil. Rockets were also fired towards the areas of Kiryat Shmona and Margaliot. A drone was also intercepted above Minara, and several anti-tank missiles were also fired towards that region. Regarding IDF activity, on April 26, the IDF carried out several rounds of attacks throughout southern Lebanon. These included attacks that were carried out in the areas of Tir Herfa, Ita Asha'ab, other attacks against Hezbollah structures in Rihan and the Kila village, and Hezbollah infrastructure was also attacked in the Shaba region. In addition, as part of this ongoing escalation, the IDF carried out an assassination of several prominent figures of the Fajr force. This is a military wing of the Jama'a Islamiyah. This is another group that has been very active in Lebanon and specifically started firing rockets at Israel since the war began at the end of October. According to reports, Mossab Saad Halif and Bilal Muhammad Halif were assassinated in this attack. The assassination took place in the western regions of the Bekaa Valley, this is much deeper in the northeastern parts of Lebanon, reportedly as drones fired at their car. It was not reported what specifically their role in the organization was, but it was reported that they are prominent figures and have been in charge of a lot of rocket fire and planning terror activity against Israel. One of the things that Jamal Islamiyah, and specifically their Fajr forces, have tried to do has carry out cross-border insurgencies several times since the war began. In addition to this, on April 27th, uh, the IDF carried out attacks targeting Hezbollah infrastructure in the areas of Marhaba and Serbin. al reported that 14 Lebanese were injured in the attacks near Serbin. Earlier in the day, attacks were also reported against Hezbollah military structures in the areas of the Koza region. al also reported that gunfire was opened at agricultural vehicles in the areas of al -Mari. The IDF made no comment about the reports about the, of this gunfire. Amidst all these escalations, El Ahbar, which is a Hezbollah affiliate, reported that the U.S. special envoy to the region, Amos Hochstein, is due to travel to Beirut in the coming days, aiming to scale down the recent escalations and, quote, bring the sides back to the rules of engagement. By stating that it's back to the rules of engagement, it means the, quote-unquote, rules of the game with the tacit rules that have been established between the IDF and Hezbollah, that is, the range in which the Hezbollah fires rockets, and in turn, the extent to which the IDF carries out attacks against Lebanon, it was reported in the last several months that Israel is specifically aiming to break those rules of the game and is not willing to adhere to the limited escalations of Hezbollah anymore. However, it remains to be seen what Amos Holstein can do. In the past, he has been quite successful in de-escalating the tensions between the sides. Other news related to Syria. Reports were published on April 26 that Israel has issued warnings to Assad and in general to the Assad regime, stating that if Syria enters the war more actively, Israel will work to overthrow the regime itself. The message was reportedly reissued to Syria following the April 1st attack in Damascus. This may be associated with the reports that emerged regarding Iran's retaliation that Assad explicitly forbid Iran from carrying out the retaliation from within Syrian soil. Amidst this, on April 27th, there were reports in Syria that the IDF carried out an attack in the al Hadr area near the Dara region. No details were given, however, about what this attack included. Moving on to some of the regional developments, on April 26, the Houthi spokesperson Yahya Saria stated that the Houthis managed to hit a British oil tanker, the, Andro the Andromeda Star, with several nautical missiles. This was later confirmed by different reports stating that the oil tanker was hit, however, that no damage was done. In addition, the Houthis also stated that they intercepted and shot down a U.S. MQ-9 drone in the Sa'ada region of Yemen. This was not reported about by U.S. Central Command. On April 27th, Iran announced that it is going to release the crew of the MSC Ares. This is the ship that it hijacked on April 13th, claiming that it was an Israeli ship. It's important to note that the ship is partly owned by an Israeli. However, none of the 25 personnel that were on board and were kidnapped are Israelis. According to Iran, they are going to be released. However, Iran did not specifically state when they are going to be released. This is somewhat significant because this is another indication that Iran is trying to signal that it is willing to now de-escalate the situation between Iran and Israel and let the situation return to quote-unquote normal between the sides. This is the last move that regards the, that escalation that, it, that started with the attack in Damascus, then Iran's retaliation, then Iran hijacked the ship, then Israel retaliated. This would be effectively putting a close to the open scores between the sides.
Some political reports from the last of the last several days, there are major protests that are breaking out in Israel following the publication of the different hostage videos. I remind everyone that in the hostage videos published today, both hostages explicitly call upon Israelis to go out and protest and to try to apply pressure on the government. Responding to this call, there were several thousand people that protested throughout Israel, blocking highways and lighting fires, and different displays were also put up in different areas, calling upon the government to reach a hostage deal. And finally, it was reported that U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is going to be making another visit to the Middle East in the coming week. He is reportedly going to arrive in Saudi Arabia and then on Tuesday arrive in Israel. This comes amidst the United States' attempts to revive the normalization talks between Saudi Arabia and Israel that are supposed to involve a three, three-way deal, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and the United States. And as part of that, Israel is going to receive normalization with Saudi Arabia, and in turn, Saudi Arabia is going to receive a defense alliance with the United States. But Saudi Arabia is conditioning this on Israel actually taking concrete steps towards the establishment of a Palestinian state. So it remains to be seen how Blinken can try to facilitate this on his trip. If you find these reports important, please do remember to hit that like button, subscribe, turn on notifications if you want to know when reports come out. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. Those are my highlights from the last 48 hours. I'll be back in the coming days.